and we have a wonderful account from uh, Guy Abau, who whose uh, European name was Willie McKenzie. So he, he gave delightful accounts of everything from um, being born through to funeral rites. Um, and uh, I was just intrigued by his accounts of, of the protocols involved with a woman in childbirth and how there'd be women who would assist her. But um, as with um, mothers everywhere, the whole um, preparation for the birth begins, of course, before the delivery. And so uh, he mentioned that one of her obligations would be to provide a possum skin cloak for her husband and if she had any children, her husband and children. So while she was in a separate hut uh, in the weeks, in the week before delivery and in weeks following, her husband had no contact with the father of the baby and with her husband. So he was back in their main hut uh, with any other children and so her obligation was to make sure that there was a possum skin cloak big enough to cover her husband and her children in her absence. So, you know, that was one of the preparations for childbirth was to make sure you had this extra large possum skin cloak to make sure your family was protected, which would have been extra important in the winter. Um, and then she, of course, would have um, made additional um, possum skin um, cloth for herself um, and her baby um, because, of course, she, um, uh, to carry the baby, there was always um, either a woven um, basket or a rug slung over the body. So, um, yes, it was wonderful to have Guy Bao's accounts. Guy Bao talked about, too, about using, uh, I think it was paper bark, different, he could na he names the different barks as well as the, um, as well as the possum skin that either the mother or the women assisting her used to wipe the child because the mother and child didn't bathe. There was a, there was a rule about not bathing till two or three weeks after delivery. Um, and so, yeah, he just gives a very brief description of the kind of material um, objects that the women use to, to clean the baby and then um, coating it in, um, in um, charcoal from the fire to cleanse it. So, yes, he has fascinating details. Guy Abau does discuss the sinew that was used as a thread and there were different Sometimes they used animal sinews, sometimes they used local vines, depending on what was to be produced, because there was such a variety of nets and baskets, as well as cloaks that were used. Part of my recognition of how significant Aboriginal agency was, was reading through some of the pastoral family papers. I can remember reading uh, letters Tom Archer sent home to his family in Norway. And uh, Tom Archer is, is an interesting character, um, not as um, close to Aboriginal people as somebody like Tom Petrie, but he nonetheless arrives in New South Wales as a 14 year old and ends up joining his brothers on pastoral stations. So he kind of lives um, in frontier districts from the age of 14 and by the time he comes up here he's 17 or 18 or 19. And on his way north, um, he relies on an Aboriginal friend from the Castlereagh River area, so he was probably a Wiradjuri man. And Tom is completely dependent on his Aboriginal companion. You know, he says basically they get to the Brisbane Valley and they're short of food, so his Aboriginal friend goes and catches some wild ducks for them. And then they get caught in a really bad storm in the Brisbane Valley before they get to Durunda, which is near where the township of Woodford is today. And so they find an Aboriginal village that was temporarily vacated. And he says, you know, uh, it was a cold, rainy, stormy night. Uh, and he wrapped himself up in an Aboriginal cloak <laughs> uh, and had this wonderful sleep in this comfortable hut that was completely waterproof. And so there he was, he was being fed by his Aboriginal friend and they, they make it through to Woodford and his brothers uh, after several nights journey, several weeks journey but they do it because they are completely dependent on Aboriginal material culture, yeah. that he's got this Aboriginal possum skin cloak to roll himself up in. So um, it, it, it was just a really clear reminder of, you know, not only that the landscape was peopled, but there were villages on the landscape that whites used. Um, so it was a really helpful letter. I knew how important the possum skin cloaks were in, in all of Southern Australia. I mean, you can't, 
survive a southern Australian winter without furs and and um, it just made me realise how much of the colonial records are just so embedded in racism. They're so obsessed with Aboriginal nakedness and then you think well wait a minute <laughs> everywhere in southern Australia Aboriginal people used fur cloaks um, you had to so this is this emphasis on the nakedness is just a part of the racism that is just imbued in in the colonial eye and the, and the colonial record um, and I suppose since then it's been somewhat reinforced because our main you know our main 20th century images became the desert people who survived uh, the tr kept the traditional lifestyle the longest and so there the skins weren't as significant, not in the summer, of course they were important in the deserts in the winter. Possum skin cloaks were probably waterproof in a way that woolen blankets that the Europeans brought weren't and um, that this is perhaps why the Europeans, whenever they could, wanted the possum fur cloaks ahead of their own blankets um, but of course uh, you know the only, the only thing that the British government ever gave Aboriginal people in these decades was the annual blanket giving, in which Aboriginal people were given woolen blankets in the name of Queen Victoria. So it was a very unequal exchange. My memory is that Captain Wickham, who had responsibility for organising the days in the 1850s. There was one year where they didn't have enough, so he ordered that the blankets be cut in half. So they weren't even getting an entire blanket. You know, it was the parsimony of the colonial system is just, you know, just astonishing when you think of just the generosity of the Aboriginal community in helping Europeans um, when they first arrive in the district. Um, and yet the British government, it's, or to be fair, it's as much the local white settlers as it is the British government. It's just so parsimonious in what it returns. Blankets might be convenient and the new technology might mean that, you know, it, it, it's, it's one less task, I guess, that Aboriginal women uh, had to do. So in that sense, a blanket would have been welcomed. But the, um, the lack of generosity on the part of the white settlers is just distressing. I guess it was a sign of the fact that traditional trade was perhaps weakening, that when we see photographs where um, Aboriginal people are cloaked in woolen blankets rather than furs, because um, that's always something I look out for. But I've, I've noticed in many of the colonial photographs that it's often where there's a group photo, it's a combination. If you look really closely, some people will be using woolen blankets, some people will still have the fur skin cloaks. So. Um, and by the time we're talking about photography, most of the photos are from 1860s onwards. So it's a sign that, uh, you know, there were some people still, still making them uh, in, in the remaining decades of the 19th century. Today, the possum has recolonised our urban areas and seem incredibly preponderant, but uh, there would have been a drastic impact from tree clearing and the reduced numbers of possums. And of course, they don't last through the summer. You have to make, in the Queensland summer, you have to make your possum skins annually. Um, they, they might have lasted longer in place, on places like the Darling Downs where the summers aren't quite as hot, but on the coast, the humidity means that the cloaks um, fall apart, the fur disintegrates. So um, that would have been more of an issue, I guess, in humid coastal Queensland.